Welcome in, everyone, to a very special episode of American Joyride. I am joined today by Brent Tucker. He's a former Green Beret and Delta Force operator, and now he is the proud owner and CEO of First Responders Coffee Company. Couldn't be more excited to have him here. Thank you very much, Brent. Absolutely. Thanks. Thanks for having me. So I, I've interviewed a lot of guys from the same unit you came from. I haven't actually talked to one in about a month, month or two on the record. So we're bringing the Delta guys back into the mix. But before that, I'm curious, how did you find yourself in the Green Berets before you were an operator in the unit? Um, so I, I joined after 9-11. Um, and like, like most people who joined, uh, I made one of the biggest decisions in my military career with the least amount of knowledge of, uh, of the job I was going to do. Uh, so my recruiter actually sent me to air defense artillery. Um, and, uh, for a guy who wanted to fight for his country after nine 11, uh, air defense was not, uh, the place that, uh, he should have sent me. Um, so it t took me a year and a half, two years to kind of, you know, figure out the military, what I wanted to do. Um, and, uh, our, Thankfully, um, our unit did not deploy because I would have just ended up guarding gates and been miserable. Um, and but one of uh, one of the guys who did deploy in my unit came back from overseas, and uh, you know, was, everyone's asking him, "Hey, you know, how, how was war? You know, what what happened over there? How how was everything?" And he was like, "Man, I didn't do anything. Like, if we're an air defense guys. Like, we guard gates. Like, there's no Taliban helicopters to be shot down." And, uh, and so I was like, well, who, who is doing stuff? You know, that's, yeah, that's, that's what I want to do. And, uh, he tells this like <laughs> probably outlandish story. And he's like, man, these, these green beret teams would come in from missions with blood all over their trucks. And they'd be like, open the gate. And we'd be like, uh, you know, I need your ID sergeant. And they'd be like, F you open the gate. And, uh, and that story was like, that's, that's what I want to do. <laughs> so that's oddly enough that that story kind of drove me to be like well yeah i started asking questions like hey well how do you how do you become a green beret and uh and then then there's all sorts of misconceptions about who could go to special forces selection and that's a, a whole nother story uh on its own but i eventually ended up fighting with my own unit to go to selection um and uh went to selection uh having that real difficult process was probably one of the better things for me because there's no way I was going to quit, uh, after fighting with my unit to send me. Right. Um, and so really that's, that's, that's what got me to selection. And oddly enough, that's also what, what got me through selection. And what special forces group when you pass selection, uh, it's called the Q course, right? Yep. Yep. What yeah. special forces group did you get assigned to? Yep. So when I, when I first joined, uh, I joined the national guard. Um, and so 20th group is a national guard special forces group. You know, of course we go to active duty selection and active duty Q course. There's no, no, no difference there. And, uh, so I was with 20th group, uh, almost my whole time. Um, and I was what's, what's called a guard bum. Uh, I was single, uh, you know, I, I went on the, I went with another battalion going to Afghanistan as soon as the Q course was over. Um, like you kind of laugh about it now because everyone was in a hurry to graduate the key course and go overseas because you were worried the war is going to be over. You know, the war is going to end without you. Little did we know, you know, we had almost 20 years of war ahead of us. Um, so I, I, I hopped from deployment to deployment to deployment, all, all within 20th group. And was your experience as a green beret, what you had hoped it would be? Like you said, these guys are driving through the gates, they're covered in blood. You're thinking this, these must be the most badass dudes on the planet. They must be getting in shootouts every night. Is that what was your experience similar to that, or was it different? I yes and no, and I, I'll, I'll tell you. Uh, of all my combat deployments, w one of my best deployments was an SF deployment, as it ranks right up there with one of my best deployments in my whole military career. Um, it, you know, SF deployments are uh, are a weird beast because. They definitely allowed me to do things that I thought I would, you know, that I had signed up to do, you know, great firefights. At the end of the day, you do, you are very unique in the special operations realm where you drive your own intel, you, you know, you, you know, your targets, you collected the intel, you, everything starts and ends with the ODA. 
So that is still a very unique experience. Um, uh, but you know, some of the stuff that, you know, was, you know, the, the bad side of it, you know, just too much oversight that you shouldn't have in a special operations unit that kind of everyone at some point, everyone got, uh, got that, uh, got that experience. Uh, uh, I would say for better or for worse, but it's always for worse when, when, when the higher ups get too involved in team business. Is there an example? Is there an example you can give of where you felt the oversight was completely unnecessary? Oh, absolutely. The and uh, anyone w with this background already knows my answer before before I give it. It's the conop process. The um, you know special operation teams are small and they move fast. It's it's how they're set up to be. And when you put in a lengthy conop process that takes you hours, if not days to get out the door, you're just not efficient enough, uh, to, to do business. And so there, there were some con op process, um, that would be 40 PowerPoint slides long to go on a mission. And that's just, that's, that's ridiculous. And at some point you start feeling like you're, you're fighting your own command to get out the gate, you know, and, and the enemy. So like, I, I can't, I, I just came here to fight, to fight one person, not, not, right. not everyone. Uh, and that's, but you just, you just got used to the process. You know, you can't, you know, you can fight it all you want, but we just, you, you find ways, I don't want to say around it, but there are times you find ways around it or you just get better at the process. But at the end of the day, the, the process should have never been there. We should have trusted our guys on the ground to yeah you know, to to do to do their jobs and uh that was that was one of the motivating factors honestly to uh to 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 move on well, one of many but it was one of them well that's actually a great segue because I, my very next question is how did you find out about the unit and I want to preface that when I interview guys who got into delta in the 90s and maybe stayed through like 2009 2010 a lot of them make the comment like we didn't even know the thing existed like we weren't aware until someone told us we didn't know we joined the military. Did you, were you aware of what the unit was and what they did? I assume you must've been cause you were deploying as a green beret in a time of war. Uh, yeah, but I, I never saw those guys. They were still mythical figures, you know, uh, overseas that you never worked with. You never saw, um, the, the only time I really even knew that it existed is because the Q course happens on Bragg and, uh, at, at the end of this road is, you know, supposedly where, where the unit's at, you know, and, and at some point, you know, probably every Q course student, student drives down that road just, just to see the building at the end of that road. Um, so I, I, I knew it existed, uh, because of, you know, being on brag. Um, but oddly enough, I, I knew it existed more because Eric Haney wrote a book called inside Delta force right. you know, while I was in the Q course. And, uh, and I, I read every special operations book I could get a hold of, you know, while I was in the Q course, um, basically from Vietnam to, to more current era. And, uh, so as soon as that thing came out, I, I read it in like 30 hours. So I was, I was well aware of the unit thanks to that book. And, and for our viewers who might not know that book by Eric Caney was the inspiration of the old CBS TV show, the unit, like the mid two thousands. Right. Yeah. And it was a great, it was a great book. I mean, I mean, if, uh, and I, like I said, I remember reading it in the Q course. And so I, at the time, you know, I wasn't worried about going to the unit. I was just, I was just going to be happy to be a green beret. Um, so, uh, it wasn't, and you know, till years later that I got to selection, but I remembered those stories of selection from, uh, from his book that were, that were, and that's 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 what most people are mad at him about is uh, he his he, he talked about selection and that's something we just don't talk about. Right. No, I, I I've heard. Uh, well, there's plenty of articles online about how that that drove a, a wedge between him and a lot of other people. Which I will we'll have a question about that later in the interview, kind of on a on a very similar topic. When you finally get there, you've passed selection, you've done all the stuff you got to do to go in. Uh, one of the things I'm curious about. Is it better to be really smart if you want to make the unit, or is it better to be a freak of nature athlete? Do you need a blend? Like if a, if a young man's watching this right now, he's like, I want to do what Brent Tucker did. Better to be smart, better to be tough, what? 
Uh, that that's a good question because to be honest with you, I mean, the, the cliche answer is both, and and that that is a, an actual answer, you know, as cliche as it is. Uh, but I've, um, you won't see a lot of guys that that aren't um, that aren't very smart, you know, make it to the unit. But I, I've seen I've seen guys that just they were just they were just smart enough. But man, were they, you know, were they, were they strong, you know, and they, they're just going to, they're just going to power their way through everything. And, uh, I would argue we, we need those guys, you know, but, uh, that's definitely not the bulk of our force. Uh, and most guys really are, are, are both like the, the smartest guys I've, I've, I've ever worked with or over at the unit. And how long before, how long after you get through all the training, the selection, OTC, all that stuff. Was it before you then actually deployed as a member, as an operator of Delta? Uh, it was just a couple of months. Uh, I went went right into a pre-deployment and 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 right into a deployment. Uh, um, yeah, of course. At, yeah, at at that time, and uh, you know, and to take a step back, what, what, one of the reasons I I went there is because I wanted to keep deploying. Twentieth um, group, yeah, you know, be a National Guard group. At the end of the day, deployed. You know, if if you wanted to deploy it as much as 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 anyone else, I mean, as I could just raise my hand and, and go overseas, which is what I did a lot. Um, but I Iraq had 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 gone away. Afghanistan, you know, the writing on the wall on Afghanistan. Um, at the time, I didn't think Afghanistan was going away, but combat operations in Afghanistan were getting harder and harder and harder to get out the gate. Um, and so, uh. You know, the, the two reasons I went was I wasn't done going to war. I wanted to, you know, keep deploying and, uh, and two, you know, I didn't want to retire, you know, thinking what if, right. uh, and I tell people all the time, I, I, I wasn't the best guy on my ODA. You know, there were probably two guys. If you asked me that I thought, you know, if, if you, if you asked me to, who was the best guy on my ODA, I'd probably put two guys ahead of me and, and that's the truth. Um, but they didn't, they didn't go to selection. Uh, for whatever reason, and maybe they would have made it. Maybe they wouldn't have. Uh, you know, we the selection's a crazy process. I've seen I've seen guys that I knew in SF, their selection that I knew were better than me that didn't make it to the end. And for the life of me, I I you know I I don't know why they didn't, and I don't know why I did. And sometimes that's just uh, yeah, that's it's just how you know life deals your cards. Is the expectation when you're operating at that tier one level, you're you're among the best of the best. These are the these are the tip of the spear. The day they, you know, I'm metaphorically or not, this is the day they stamp your papers and you're in. Is it you better be every bit as good as we need you to be immediately? If the phone goes off in the next three minutes, even though you just showed up, you better be ready to rock and roll today. One hundred percent. I I won't get uh, too much in into the into the details. But, uh, you know, the, one of the, the, uh, one of the first things I, I did in the unit was go, go train for something, you know, that, that we were getting ready to do. And it was a national level mission and I'm a brand new guy and I'm on the mission <laughs> and there's, uh, you know, there, we, we, we didn't bring in, you know, the good old boy system and just, you know, co collect all-star teams for big missions. You know, you, you graduate OTC. And yeah, you know, your your number gets called for your troop, your squadron to go. You're going day one. Um, but the good news is, uh, OTC is is long enough. It's without a doubt hard enough. Uh, every don't get me wrong. No one no one graduates that you know that that course thinking they're as good as a you know yeah you know, as good as an operator as you're going to get. Like, you absolutely know you have a, a lot more to go, but you also have the confidence knowing. Uh, I can handle anything that's thrown at me. I want to get into a little bit of uh, the actual combat side and kind of the emotional response that you experience. And this is probably going to go way back to your Green Beret days because you were there, you know, on deployments long before you got to the unit. The first time you got shot at, do you remember what you were thinking? Because I hear some <laughs> guys, they're like, it was the oh. best day of my life. Other guys were like, I, did, I didn't know what I was thinking. You're laughing already, so I can tell yeah. that you know exactly what you're thinking. Oh, my my first mission in SF was the best and worst thing to happen to me, and, I, and I'll tell you why. Um, and uh, of course, it's it's always 
um, easier to talk about those missions because uh, I'll talk about those all, all day long. Yeah, um, we get this. Uh, we get a call uh, that uh, this the best way to describe it. This bad guy barbecue was happening. Daylight daylight mission. Uh, uh, the um, regional level uh, HVT high level target. Uh, it was definitely a juicy target for for SF. Um, they brought in another ODA uh, to come in with us. Um, we had mid, and even uh, we had we always have to have you know Afghans with us. We brought in the minimum amount of of Afghans with us uh, for for lift reasons, and um, and you didn't get a whole lot of what felt like a unilateral daytime raid going after an HVI in Afghanistan. And that ended up being my first mission. And, um, the, uh, the Chinooks were, were landing on target, um, with the, the ramp facing the target. And, uh, I was, I was like 10th back and the, uh, I mean, it's just a wall of green berets in front of me, you know? So, you know, it was going to take a while for, for me to get up there. I mean, I couldn't wait to get off this aircraft and, and do my job finally. Right. And, uh, I'm looking out the, the window, the small bubble window of a, of a 47. And I'm thinking, man, this guy's coming in fast. And man, this guy's coming in fast. That's my first mission. Like, man, these, these guys come in hard and fast. And then we're really close to the ground. And I'm thinking this guy's coming in fast. And I scream as loud as I can. I grab onto the cargo netting beside me and I scream, hold on. Which of course no one can hear. You know the, the blades are turning on our forty-seven, and at that moment the guy behind me saw me grab onto the cargo net, and he did. And when it and when it hit really hard, everybody in front of me fell, and I literally just ran right on top of all those guys. And now it's just me and my Bravo are now at the at, at leading this target. You know, by the time everyone gets up, and it's like a. 150 meter run to this target compound. And there's already, uh, 64s, you know, circling and, uh, there's, and you can I, you know, still remember there's like the, the, uh, the jumping on the ground of, of like dirt piles jumping and, and realizing later that, you know, those, those are rounds going everywhere. I'm telling you, it's like a scene out of a movie. Um, one of the one of the attack helicopters is making a run. He should have been making kind of a left or right run, but he's making a run towards us, a gun run, and uh, he lets off uh, you know some of his, his his missiles on the side of his uh, of his helicopter, and it goes over the target, and it lands in between me and my Bravo, and we jump out of the way to not get hit by this missile, and now there's dirt you know everywhere. Uh, and I remember getting up and looking at him and just, we're just laughing. Like, is this like, is, is this, uh, this is awesome. You know, we finally make it to target. Uh, there's, you know, there's, uh, we killed two people inside the building. Uh, it was, it was a great close quarter, you know, combat experience, uh, for that. Um, we end up that whole village opened up fire on us, not just the target compound. So we were told to stay there all night. And then the AC-130s, you know, uh, guarded us all night. And all night long, guys were trying to, you know, probe our, uh, you know, we, the target we took down was the building we stayed in that night. And uh, we got into firefights, you know, randomly, you know, small ones, but sporadic ones all night, you know, continued to kill people through the night and uh, finally got on a helicopter the next day and left and thinking, I remember thinking, man, I love combat. Like that was exactly what I thought combat was. So that's, a, that's what I hoped combat was. Um, little did I know it would be a long time before I saw another mission uh, like that, that, that dicey and with, you know, all, with all those variables, but that, that was my intro to combat and I couldn't have loved it anymore. <laughs> that That's wild. Your first mission, there's missiles flying through the air, bullets <laughs> yeah. going everywhere. People are getting killed. That yeah. that is that is literally, I think, the definition of baptism by fire. That is yeah. about as real as it gets. It's so a good just, one. You so you just said that you didn't realize it'd be a while before stuff like that happened again. You know, people have different versions. Some maybe play loose with the truth, exaggerate a little bit. <laughs> 
Uh, they absolutely I, do. I, I know a guy uh, from your old unit, and he said that he probably pulled the trigger way less than 5% of the time on any target in that at that level. In your experience, and he was like, that's low. Like some guys claim it was 50% of the time. He's like, no, if you're shooting at people 50% of the time, stuff has gone wrong. You're not doing things right. His words, not mine. So he said 5% is what he would put the number at. Where would you kind of put that number at? Is it Green Beret or wherever? How often are you actually having to pull the trigger on a target? As a Green Beret, the, the, just the truth is not not much. You know, uh, you get into a lot of firefights at distance. Um, you know, you you call it in casts. You know, you you don't you don't get close and personal with the enemy uh, like like I did a lot more often at the unit. There were definitely times, you know, there's, that's just always a, it's a risky job. So it's, it's always, it could happen at, at, at any moment and randomly it would, but, uh, you know, it's hard to put a percentage on it, but most missions were, you know, were, were easy missions, you know, most missions, you know, not, you know, not a, not a shot was fired at all. You know, not without a doubt, not everybody died on every, on every target, um, and yeah, you know, when you really talk about um, my SF days in Iraq, yeah, you know, and, and even and every theater is different. You know, the, the guys came to fight in Afghanistan way more than they came to fight in Iraq with the target sets that we were going after. Almost every target set in Iraq, even though we knew the intel was good, it was our intel. Like we we were we were certain, and we had the we had the 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 intelligence and the dual sourced reports not just from one guy but from several people saying you know this is a bad guy and these are all the things he did and uh you know we'd hit his house in the middle of the night and either you know pull him out of his bedroom while he's hiding uh or you know or he's still asleep by the time you get to his room you know that you got the, the target set for us in iraq was a lot of people giving up um i really think they'd rather uh, fight it out in the court system than with the Americans knowing that they'll, they'll win and they'll get out eventually because we went after a lot of you know, fancy word, but you know, recidivists, which are, you know, prior, you know, prior offenders. But, but in Afghanistan, they were way more willing to, to take shots that you coming in. Abs absolutely. And now, and, and I'm not saying that they're willing to fight it out toe to toe with you. But, you know, they, they love taking pop shots at you. They love, you know, they love shooting at you from, from the mountainside and at a distance. In Afghanistan, if you stay in one place long enough, they 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 are they are going to come say hi to you uh, for sure. Which, just generally speaking, what wasn't the case in, in Iraq. What are your rules of engagement like in a situation like that where, you know, it's not like World War II where guys are wearing uniforms. You can look over there like, oh, those are Germans, those are Japanese. It's like the civilian population is wearing, correct me if I'm wrong, pretty much the exact same thing as everyone else. So do you, do they have to fire at you first? Or if you see a guy with an AK coming 200 yards off, can you engage him? What are, what's the situation like that? So, and you know, here, here's something that uh, I think is, is a misconception that everyone understands is everyone has the same rules of engagements. Everyone's got the same rules of engagements and the, and the rules of engagements are, um, the uh you know anyone that's that's a that's a a threat to you um you know you you can engage and there's there's two words i'm probably not going to remember off the top of my head now that uh, i'm on a podcast having to remember them uh, i immediate threat and imminent threat those are the those are the two things that everyone has within their roe and i'll tell you exactly what that means an immediate threat is exactly what you're talking about a guy with an ak I come into a room, you know, or I turn the corner on a street and there's a guy with an AK and it's not just a guy with an AK. He could be a policeman, but he looks at me and he raises his AK. He clearly, he's an immediate threat to me. I can, I can shoot him all day long. And those, those engagements are never questioned. They're, they're just, they're cut and dry. Here's where it gets, here's where it gets, uh, um, different really between the different units. Everyone has imminent threat as well, but not everyone, not everyone acts on imminent threat in the same way. And, and, and I'll explain that. Imminent threat means I'll, I'll make up a situation that's never happened. Um, 
a guy could be on a cell phone across the street. And if I believe, if I truly believe he's calling in a QRF, I don't have to wait for the QRF to get here to go, oh, I'm going to shoot that guy now because he was calling in a, a QRF on a cell phone. I mean, he is an, he's an imminent threat. Right. Um, if a guy is, and these are all subjective calls that, you know, that the guy on the ground gets to make and has to live with. If a guy is running around, you know, let's take him to Afghanistan. He's running to the, uh, to the base of the mountain. And if I believe based on Intel that they have fighting positions at the base of the mountain, I don't have to wait for him to get to the base of the mountain and grab a gun to go. That's what I thought. And now that he's armed, we'll shoot it out. I can shoot him as he's running away, going to that, you know, to, to that, uh, fighting position. But yeah, you, know, you better be, but you'll be questioned on it and you better be able to articulate, you know, and, and with reasonable, you know, reasonable justifications of, of, of why you took those shots. Because I, I also assure you, even though those, they seem like loose rules of engagements and they kind of are, um, but if, if you have a guy on your team taking advantage of, uh, you know, of those, of those, he'll, he'll find his way off the team really quick. But we, we're, we're not the evil people, right. uh, the rest of the world perceives us to be, we, we don't put up with that. Um, and, and really more, um, more importantly, you know, to me, it's more of a, uh, it's, and, and, the, and the, the unit will ask you this all the time. It's not necessarily the decision you made. They want to know why you made that decision. Why did you make it? So to, you know, you could have the, the, the same decision, but one could, but the reason you made it could be wrong. And that says way more about it. So if you have a guy that, per, that is perceiving things to just not be the ground truth, you know, and he's, he's shooting at people because what is really happening is something way more dangerous in his mind then he doesn't have a good grasp on the reality of the situation. And that's more or less, you know, the reason why we're going to get rid of them. Do you have any situations now you're talking about imminent threat and immediate threat? Do you have anything that you can talk about from either side of your career where you're like, holy shit, I can't believe we're walking out of this one alive. Um, <laughs> there, I mean, there's, the night I got shot, uh, I, I, I shouldn't, I shouldn't have walked out of that one alive. Um, we, uh, it's man, it's that, that, that one's a long story. I'll, I'll try to give you a, a dig a, in, a, a, dig in. And, um, I'll try to give you a, and, uh, and again, it's, it's a unit story. So I'll, I'll make it, um, I'll make it un, unfortunately somewhat vague, That's but fine. the, but the, but the backside of the story still remains is we were going after a very, very high target individual and, um, the the way we wanted to go after him uh we were told that we were going to go tonight and for these reasons and uh, we basically told him hey there's there's a smarter way to do business uh you know we um trust us this is this is what we do we'll hit him tomorrow uh, and under the circumstances that 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 we want um and they basically said uh that's that's fine then then we'll send the rangers <laughs> And, uh, and we basically got together and we're like, people are going to die tonight if, if the Rangers go and that's not knocking the Rangers, the Rangers are great dudes. Um, but at the end of the day, they're, 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 they're not us. And this, you know, you, uh, you know, when you do this, this job long enough, you, you know, when you get a, a warning order, if this is going to be, you know, one of those missions or not, and this was just going to be one of those missions. Everything was difficult about the target. There was no good way to get in. There was a lot of them. It was going to be uh, a nasty one, and and it was. And uh, so we basically took it to a vote, and we're like, "Hey, you know, do do, you know, do, do we, are, are we going to go tonight, or you know, are we going to let the Rangers go go take this one?" And uh, every every person in that room raised their hand. Um, and again, it wasn't for glory purposes. Like we, we truly believe we were saving guys' lives that night by, by uh, us taking a bad mission that we normally would not have, have taken. So, uh, we, uh, 
we take off on uh, on, on this target, and um, just everything was difficult about it. Um, everyone loves you know uh, the movie when guys are fast roping on the target. You don't want to fast rope on the target. <laughs> Let me tell you, you don't want to be thirty feet off the ground on the noisiest thing in the valley, dangling on a rope or waiting for your turn to dangle on a rope. It is not a good feeling. It's a good way to get a helicopter shot down. It's a good way to get guys shot before they even get a chance to fight. Um, so even though it's there are times it's the right call, it's not. Uh, it's it's rarely is it option A. Um, we we couldn't take that, and so unfortunately, this this target was right in the middle of the village. So really, the only good way to do it was to land outside the village and run all the way, you know, into target, which unfortunately is going to take some time. And, you know, the, the surprise is, is probably going to be given, it's going to be uh, given up. So, uh, that's what we did. We, we took that option. And by the time we got to target, there wasn't a, a single person in the, uh, inside the, inside the target house, but there was a fresh fire going. There's a lot of, uh, Taliban, um, uh, paper, uh, paper trail. So we knew someone was there. We knew the intel was right. That we knew they were there that night. That they just heard the helicopters and took off. Um, so we had a most of the assault team had a follow on target. They were going to go hit. We we had reason to believe uh, a house not too far away was a family member's house, and they were going to go do a follow on target there. Seemed like a reasonable place for him to go. Um, I was on what's called squirter duty that night. Um, familiar with the term squirter? Yeah. Yeah. Squirter when guys patrol, squirter yeah, yeah. Yeah. When they jump, but yeah, when guys start spraying out in all directions, they could be running for weapons. They could be running just to run, but yeah, you'll explain it better to the audience. For the yeah, audience. That's, yeah. That's, that's exactly right. You know, sometimes I hear the helos and they don't exactly have a plan. They just know they don't want to be in the house. You know, that, you know, they, they, they assume those, the guys in those helos are coming for them. So they'll, they'll, uh, they'll, Usually, like I said, it's it's usually not a, a pre-planned thing they do. They just run and they hide in a field. They hide behind trees. They hide behind rocks. Anywhere they they feel like they've gone far enough, and they just kind of hunker down. Um, so it was uh it was me, um, a combo guy, uh, a couple Afghans, and a dog guy, and um, but I I was the only operator on the um on the uh on the detail going out. And that's usually um, a no, no. Um, even though I had other Americans with me, it, you know, you, you really want more than one operator with you. Cause at the end of the day, you know, that, that combo guy was a green beret and the dog handler was a green beret, but in those roles are filling, they're not, they're not filling green beret roles. If you will, you know, their, their job now is to be a dog guy. Their job now is to be the world's best combo guy. So I was really only shooter going out. Um, and that was definitely a mistake on my part. But I didn't want to take a I didn't want to take an assaulter off the follow on crew, you know, and and leave them short. So um, I didn't take another one with me. Um, and we we went around. There were there were several um, pockets of of small groups of individuals hiding from us. Um, we we took care of them pretty quick. Uh, and then we hear over the radio that the second place was a dry hole. And so now that makes squirter duty even more important because he's he's here. We know he's here. We know he's somewhere. And if he's not in any of these two houses, he's probably hiding in one of these squirter pockets. So um, one of the uh, second, I didn't know at the time, but was going to be the second to last pocket of squirters um, I come up against. Um, they're hiding in this, uh, orchard and I hate orchards. Orchards are, are the worst because you can, you know, ISR can tell you, uh, or whoever's giving you information can tell you how many people are in there, but it's, it's, it's rarely right. There's just too many places to hide. Um, and it's, it's, uh, people get shot up in, in, in orchards, you know, uh, I'd say fairly often, but it's, it, it's not what you want. Um, this orchard has this like half wall around this whole orchard. This orchard is about, uh, it's about half the size of a football field with a half wall that surrounds it. 
and we're sneaking up to this orchard and I can see a group of them talking about 10 yards from the, maybe five yards from the half wall. And so I tell everyone, um, I don't know if I've ever told this story in, in this much detail. And I tell everyone, I said, Hey, everyone stay here. I'm going to move up to this half wall. And I, after I throw a grenade, then I want you guys to move up online and, you know, and that'll, that'll kick off this, uh, this assault. And I am, I am giddy. Like, I'm already thinking this is going to be awesome. Like the boys by the fire, when they hear this story, it's going to be amazing. And I make it, I sneak my way up to this half wall and I'm kind of laying on my back with the half wall right here. And I get the grenade out and I'm getting ready to chuck the grenade over this half wall. And I'm just, I'm just excited. I'm like, man, this is going to be a good one. And I look over one last time to see if the guys are in their position. And this one Afghan is still kind of moving into his position. And he trips in the middle of the night. He trips and he lands. And I, I could hear those guys, you know, speak in whatever language they're speaking. I mean, they're, they're super close. And when he trips, they stop talking. It was so loud. And then I hear him running to the half wall. And as I'm standing here, I, their AKs are now on the, over the half wall, just spraying everywhere. They don't, they just know there is a sound in the darkness. And I'm like, and I remember sitting there going as they're just empty and mags with their barrels, a couple feet over my face going just mad at the Afghan that he took this amazing moment from me. And so after they get done, you know, spraying, I didn't. I, I, I felt like I knew they were running away, but I didn't want to be wrong, you know, and put my, put my hand up there while they're reloading and get my hand shot, holding a grenade. Uh, when I was, yeah, it, what felt like forever it was a couple seconds and I knew they weren't there anymore. I popped up real quick and I threw my grenade as hard as I could. Uh, here's, here's another thing that uh, will surprise a lot of people. Grenades don't kill people especially out in, in, the, in the open air in a field. I, I mean, you'll wound them and you'll piss them off, but grenades don't kill people. And they they end up running away. And at this point, now I'm just super pissed off at them that they shot at our guys. I'm mad that my, my moment of glory was taken away by an Afghan tripping in the dark. And uh, so I make sure that, that they're followed. And, and we haven't got jackpot yet. So I'm fairly certain he's in this group. So they end up running away about a click away, a thousand meters away from the target location. That's normally too far for a small group to venture out from the main element. Every, you know, hindsight's always 2020. At that point, I should have called for a couple more operators to plus up and let them know that I was you know, going this far away, uh, from, from the main element. Um, but I didn't, you know, I was just out of, out of, uh, anger, followed them. And, um, at this point I get talked on and, and that I get told, Hey, they are in this, they're in this area. Um, and as we get really close to them, it's just, it's just the way the world works. Our comms, go completely dark. I I don't, I don't, we can't get a message out. We can't get a message in. So now it's just me and this small team without any comms at all, wandering around this small area that we know they're at, but we can't get any further intel of, of, of exactly where they're hiding. Like we, we kind of normally do. Um, so there is this, and we're in this big field. The best way to describe it is there's this big bomb crater in, in this field. And uh, I remember going up, looking inside it. It was a very dark night, no loom night. You know, your nods don't work as good on a no loom night. Like your nods aren't just magic. They amplify the existing light. So a little bit of moonlight helps out your nods immensely. So it was a no moonlight, no loom night. And it was raining that night. And so, you know, they're all fogged up, no loom. I looked down there and it didn't look like anything. So we go searching around. At this point, 
we get a little bit of radio chatter in and out talking about, hey, where are you guys at? Um, hey, the helos are running out of gas. You know, they're either going to have to go all the way back and refuel and come back, which is going to take an hour, or we need you guys to hurry up and, you know, get done doing whatever you're doing and come back. And so uh, we huddle up and I tell them, I said, hey, all right, let's, let's go back. But before we go back, that, that crater, I just, I just, my spider senses, whatever it is, like won't let me, you know, like completely, you know, uh, I, I just don't feel right. And they're like, well, what do you want to do? Um, and I had a couple ideas. Uh, I thought about um, throwing a grenade in that crater. Uh, but if I was wrong and they were hiding somewhere else, I would have definitely given up our position. So I didn't want to do that. Um, the, you know, right, wrong, or indifferent, you know, people can armchair this decision all they want, but, uh, my plan was, this is what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna get us up on a line and I'm a, I was called a, a white light blip, which means I'm just going to turn on my white light for just a split second and kind of look underneath my nods so I can absolutely rule this out. And, and the thought process was if I white light blip it, maybe, you know, if they're not looking in this direction, they might see something. But, you know, chances are they don't, you know, they'll just go, did you see that? They you know, may not have really known where we are. It's really unusual. We don't normally use white lights, you know, on, on nighttime operations. But like I said, I had to clear this depression and my nods just weren't good enough to do it. Um, so I go up there and I go to white light blip it. And I could see at that point, those weren't rocks at the bottom of this depression. It was rocks and guys hiding underneath blankets. And so, and in fact, I kind of didn't even intend to see anything. I kind of was just like, well, I'm just going to, I blipped it. I started to turn a, to turn away. And in my mind, uh, it registered what I just saw. And so I came back and kept the white light on. And I said, it, uh, the G rated version is there they are, get them. And, uh, and, you know, and we start, we start shooting them. Unfortunately, I was the only one to take shots. Uh, the Afghans were more of a spectator that night. And, uh, the, the first guy I shot was still underneath his blanket. So he died. That did, didn't even know why the second guy I transitioned over to was just kind of starting to look underneath his, his blanket. Um, I had a suppressed gun at the time, but I wasn't running subsonic ammo. So you could, I mean, you can hear it. Right. Uh, so between the white light and, and the rounds going off, I mean, he was interested to see what was going on. And so I gave him the good news. Um, and the, and so, you know, the next guy over, he's a little bit further out underneath his blanket and starting to reach for his gun. And so, uh, I, I give him, I, I give him the, some, the, the, uh, the same treatment his other two friends got, but every person I'm transitioning over to is a little bit, is a little bit closer to, to being up and ready. And so, you know, I, I send, you know, four to six rounds at, at each guy. But there, here's another thing that it's no one shouldn't say no one. You shouldn't, no one shoots guys twice and, and moves on. Like you shoot guys until they, until they stop until they're no longer a threat. So, you know, everyone's getting four or six. You know, the first guy got like eight rounds. Um, when I transition over to the last guy, he, uh, he's got his, he's, he has come, his, he has his gun coming up and I'm still look and I just transitioned over to him and I'm, and I'm thinking he's, he's closer to shooting me than I am him. And, uh, I, I push my gun as, you know, as hard and fast as I can through a couple rounds his way. He, he went on full auto and, and sprayed up, um, uh, the first couple rounds hit the base of my feet, kind of walking up the, one of the rounds hits me right in the, uh, in my forearm breaks my arm in half. And then the last round as it, as it, as it turned me, it went right through the middle of my nods and broke my nods in half and they're dangling on my face. And I spin around like four times and, and hit the ground and, uh, I remember laying in the mud going, damn it. I knew I was going to get shot one day. I, I was the only guy on my team without a purple heart, the only guy. And I just remember going, 
that didn't hurt as bad as I thought it was going to hurt. And uh, at that time, our combo guy, you know, this all happens in a matter of five seconds. Our combo guy runs up and throws a grenade down into the hole or not a hole, you know, down into this big depression. And it, uh, whatever it does, it probably lands beside a rock and it goes off. It doesn't, it doesn't hit him. But what it does is it reminds him that he has a grenade and this happened for whatever reason on this particular rotation, almost every time we introduce grenades, we got a grenade back. It's almost like reminding them, oh yeah, we carry these too. So he throws a grenade out of the hole and I'm laying on my back and it lands within arm's distance of me. And what saved my life was a muddy, rainy night. It sunk down into the mud. It went off a couple seconds later. Uh, it blasted my helmet off, my peltors to shred. You know, it's got some scarring underneath my, uh, my beard. And you know, I got scars up and down my leg. Um, but generally speaking, that mud tamped that grenade and absorbed most of that explosion. Um, and so now, now I'm shot. My nods are shot off. I get hit by a grenade just a couple seconds later. And, uh, and he goes to crawl out of the hole and, uh, our, our combo guy, you know, eventually fills him in with a, with an absolute full mag. I mean, all 30 rounds into this guy. And, and it's over kind of, um, so now he actually, gosh, almost he gets as, as he's crawling out, he, 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 he sends out a couple like kind of security rounds and then tries to crawl out and he hits our combo guy in the leg. And so our combo guy's shot and then kills him. I'm shot. I have no nods. Um, you know, I, I have an arm that we, to get to that point, we jumped a lot of walls trying to make a straight line to this point. Now I can't jump walls. You know, I, I got a broken, I got a, I got a, um, uh, oh gosh, can't believe I forget these words. Uh, I got a tourniquet on my arm that without a doubt felt 10 times worse than getting shot. The tourniquet was absolutely excruciating. Um, and it took us almost an hour to get back to our, uh, to our element. And during this hour, we made another mistake of, um, it was again, that, that village was pretty lively. And so we're, we're trying to sneak our way back, but we can't use the back roads if we will. Like we literally kind of have to use trails and roads within the village to, to quickly get back to our element. Well, when we stopped and checked out all of my, um, my injuries, we used red light because we were still in a tactical situation, which we, I, I know better. The problem with using a red light is you can't see blood underneath a red light. And now my biggest injury that I was concerned about was, was my arm. I, I, I didn't complain about the massive bleeding in my leg or in my side because I didn't even, I didn't even feel that, that that had happened. And so we never did a full body check on me to see if I had any other injuries. We just addressed the big injury without addressing the, you know, doing a full body check again, something, something we knew better than, and just, you know, didn't, didn't do it right when it counted. So about 45 minutes into this walk back that we had to take the long way around, um, I start blocking out and I don't know at the time, I didn't know why I was blocking out. And, um, and I'm telling like, Hey guys, we got to stop. Like I'm going to throw up and I'm, I'm about to pass out. And they're like, you know, Brent do not pass out. Like we're not carrying your big ass. Like we have another guy, you know, with a shot leg, he can't carry you. Like you've got to suck this up. And I remember telling you, Hey, I don't control if I black out guys, I'm just telling you it's about to happen. Like I, and they're like, well, do what you can. Uh, we eventually made it back to the, uh, to the rest of the element. And then, and at this point I'm limping and, uh, I don't even know why I'm limping. I just know my leg hurts and our, our medic comes up and he goes as, as cool as a cucumber. Hey Brent, how's it going? Not good, Dan. I'm shot. He goes, why? He goes, he goes, I can see that. He goes, anything else wrong with you? I said, no, I'm just shot. 
please look at my arm. None of the fentanyl lollipops are working. I, I took everyone's, I, I took everyone on patrol has a fentanyl lollipop, including me. I took mine. I took his, I took his, I'm eating everyone's fentanyl lollipop trying to get rid of this pain. And it just wouldn't help with the pain at all. And he goes, what's wrong with your leg? I said, nothing. It's my arm. The love of God, look at my arm. And he, and he laughs and he sticks his thumb and, and this hole in my leg and says, nothing. And I was like, oh, I'm dead. Why would you do that? He's, and he's like, you're such an idiot. And he cuts off my pant leg. He's like, what happened to your leg? And that was the first time I really realized that I had, I had eaten that grenade and didn't really know it. I was passing out from a loss of blood. Um, right. And by the time I actually got to the helicopter, I, I did pass out from a lack of blood. And I, and I passed, uh, uh, I woke up in Bagram the next day, you know, af after surgery. Um, and I remember that, and I remember sitting on the, on the, on the, the hospital bed going, that was a crazy night. I kind of can't believe we got out, uh, can't believe we got out of that one. That, that is an unbelievable story. <laughs> How long is the road to recovery for you? Not long. I, I, I never missed a rotation. Yeah. I missed a couple jump trips. Um, the, uh, the biggest thing was, um, I kept, they kept on doing washout surgeries on me um, because I, I, uh, infection was uh, was a serious concern. I had taken my my antibiotic pills. Luckily, it was one of the things I did do right. You know, we were always told, you know, you get shot, blown up, you know, something, and you know, in the nastiness of Afghanistan, you take these pills, and that's actually what saved my life. And even with those pills, um, you know, infection was was a, a a big problem within my body. Um, uh, I, we finally got the infection, uh, under control, you know, the you know, doctors were trying to, trying to be nice, but they were like, Hey, you should know, like, if we can't get this under control, you, you might lose your arm. And so, you know, every time I went under surgery, you know, I was always the first thing I checked to see if I still had my arm. Um, they never ended up having to take my arm. Um, they put a massive plate in there to, to keep my, uh, to keep my arm together. Um, and the bones, the bones actually grow back pretty fast. And, uh, I was down for three months. I mean, I wasn't back to a hundred percent, but I, I, I could operate three, yeah, you know, three months later. And, uh, like I said, never, never missed a rotation out of, uh, out of it. Did it change you in terms of how you went into combat or did you just look at it as like, Hey, it's just a numbers game. Certain percentage of people are going to get hit. I got hit. Um, it's not changed my outlook on anything. 100% changed the way I did business. This is probably, I mean, I got to throw a number at it. This is probably my seventh combat rotation, eighth, ninth, whatever it was. Um, and, you know, I had slowly been getting, um, you know, I just, I just quit. You know, the, the truth, I quit respecting combat. I put myself in situations that I would come out on top um, and it definitely put me in situations and, you know, it, it allowed me to, to kill the enemy in ways that other guys, to be honest with you, couldn't or, or not couldn't, wouldn't do. Um, and I was like, yeah, this is just, this is what aggressive people do. You know, I will, I'm stronger, I'm faster, I'm more accurate, I'm better trained. You know, there's not a situation I can't put myself in that I can't get out of within a reason. And, um, and that you will and you'll get away with it for a little bit, but at one point you will roll snake eyes. And, uh, I rolled snake eyes that night. And if I didn't go through that, you know, rotations later, you know, yeah, I find myself in Syria, you know, trip after trip. And what is definitely the most dangerous combat, uh, that I was in. And, uh, if, if I had not got that reset, you know, button by getting shot, I probably would have died in Syria. I fully believe that. I am so glad that you mentioned Syria because ISIS obviously did horrific things in Syria and Iraq. And I'm curious if you think the general public has any idea of the savagery of some of the people that we're dealing with in that region of the world. And I want to preface this. When I was in college, ISIS was starting to become like a really big problem. 
And I remember I, I was a poli sci major, which was the most useless degree in the history of the world. <laughs> but we would have debates about like, you know, the rise of ISIS, Al Qaeda, all this terrorism stuff. And there were kids at a major university that were saying there's really no difference between the terrorists and us. And they're only terrorists because we backed them into a corner. I'm like, are you, you realize they're burning people in cages, right? Do what do you, what, how different is it compared to the reality on the ground when you're dealing with those animals? Animals is exactly what they are. You know, and people ask me about, you know, you know, so uh, getting shot, losing teammates, PTSD, whatever it is, uh, or, you know, or, or, or if it's, you know, taking another person's life. And I always said, I, I never felt like I ever took another person's life. I shot a lot of two-legged animals. I shot a lot of people that were not human and did not deserve to be on this earth. So I sleep like a baby at night. And ISIS, without a doubt, was the most you know savage enemy we had come across. They had they had this um this young when when Raqqa was still their their stronghold. They had this uh, battalion called the Young Lions Battalion, and they were like seven and eight year old kids, and they were training them to be soldiers, um, which isn't that unique, except their final exercise was they would put them through this like CQB shoot house, and they would have live people, like enemy, like POW, Kurds, Christians, bound and gagged, and the same way we would go through and shoot paper targets in a shoot house, they're shooting people on their final exercise, training these kids to to murder. It's it's abs again, you know, the, that Jordanian pilot that they set on fire alive in a cage. Um, you know, the the Coptic Christians in, in Israel that they marched, I can't, I think it was 40 of them to the beach and just murdered them. The beheadings. Uh, I mean, you just, you, you name it, they were, they, uh, they deserved everything they got and more. And to be honest with you, we should have gotten involved in that, in that a lot earlier that, you know, the, the only, the only mistake America made was not doing anything until they had taken over half of Syria and half of Iraq. And now we were like, oh, maybe we should do something about this. And as I got older, I'm not the person that says we should be the world's police. I I had no problem of pulling out of Afghanistan. I I have no problem of of uh, yeah of not being the world's police. But the moment they started cutting off American heads, we should have showed up, and we could and we should have we could have. And ISIS would have been a blip on the radar, but they cut off five American heads, and we still didn't do anything about it until they had almost taken over Iraq. It's, it really was a, uh, a blunder on, on America's part. To be honest with you. Does it feel better killing someone like that compared to maybe, you know, uh, a regime loyalist or, or maybe I hear a lot of guys talk about some of the guys they fought in Afghanistan. They almost, I wouldn't say feel bad for them, but they're like, is this guy purely evil? Maybe, maybe not. But they all say when it came to ISIS, it just felt better. Did, would you agree with that? I, I would. I mean, the, the way I would rate it, if you will, and, and everyone will have a different you know experience and a different answer. Um, you know, in, in Iraq, sometimes we were in the middle of, you know, of, of a civil war, you know, at some point, you know, that at the um, uh, Afghanistan, I, I respected uh, the guys in Afghanistan, they, you know, they always come out to fight, you know, and they're at least willing to die for their cause. Um, uh, but man, I, I really, really, really hated ISIS. I, I never walked by a dead ISIS body with anything other than just joy. Were those I, know that guys... so, I know that sounds weird, but I'm just, no, no, it doesn't I'm sound just... weird. No, it doesn't sound weird at all. Yeah. Where the you know, ISIS presented it and I and I I'm enjoying this a lot. I think our viewers are gonna be fascinated by this, especially the younger ones. ISIS is they projected, you know, we're so tough, we're so violent, we're we're, we're we, you can't reach the level that we get to. When you if you captured any of these guys, did they drop the tough guy act pretty quickly or did they try to maintain that in custody? 
Uh, but you got you got a, you had a um a good mix of uh like some of the foreign fighters that would come through that they were they were tenacious, you know, and they'd look at you like, man, if if you'd take these flex cuffs off me, I'd you know I'd choke the life out of you right now. I mean, they just stare at you with dead eyes, uh, and. But uh, yeah, you, you you get a you get a mixture of of everything. There there are plenty of ISIS fighters on the front lines, you know, especially when the you know the the march to Raqqa was going on, that they didn't want to be they didn't want to be on the front lines. But it was either stay on the front lines and fight, or, um, you know, or retreat and get killed by ISIS. And you could still say, well, you know, you still enjoyed watching them die, you know, because they you know, yeah, like they. They wrote they they raised their hand to come to come fight for evil, and then they found out what evil was, and so you already voted, uh, you came to do this, and now you know be careful what you wish for. What's it like operating in a country that is essentially divided by five, six, however many different factions? You know, you got the United States, you have the Assad regime. You have the Russians who are in there. You have Iranian assets that are in there. You got yeah. ISIS that's in there. How the hell do you even know? I mean, how are, how do you know the Russians aren't just going to try rolling through wherever you are? Um, well, they tried that once, and it didn't work it, out. It, it, it didn't that's work correct. out well for them. Uh, I was there for that. Uh, the um, it, here's something that. Uh, this will make some people mad, but I don't, the, the truth is a truth that I believe generals hide behind. And and to be honest with you, so do politicians. They hide behind this lie uh, whenever something, uh, they'll say, well, it's, it's really complicated. It's actually not that complicated. You know, I, ISIS was bad. The Kurds were good. Uh, the ISIS ISIS was on this side. Uh, and we'll just, you know, keep keep killing everyone on that, on, on that side until we get to Raqqa and we free Raqqa. Um, Syria wasn't a problem. Um, Syria, the, the whole reason why ISIS was able to take over half of Syria is because the Syrian army was just inept. Um, and they, the Syrian army, you know, stayed over on the, uh, on the, on the Western side and they weren't going to, they didn't have the ability that they weren't going to go toe to toe with Americans or, or, you know, they, I believe they were more than willing to let America rid their country of, of the ISIS problem. And then they'll get their country back through political means because they know, you know, America's going to give it back to them anyway, because we're always uh, politically spineless. Um, so that, I believe that was their, uh, their goal, which, which basically worked out for them. Um, the Russians, the Russians were just there to do, you know, to, was just there to, to stir things up. But I, I I never worried about the Russians, you know, uh, being a part of the problem. The different factions, a slight problem with the different factions because who's a friend one day is an enemy the next. But that that generally wasn't uh, wasn't a problem because that that really didn't happen within the Kurds. Um, and so as long as you just you know stayed with the Kurds, the Kurds were the Kurds are really good partners. The Kurds were the best partners we've ever had. They were way better than the Afghans and way better than the Iraqis. Um, they were more than willing to fight for their cause. Uh, all they wanted was guns and ammo, and you know, point in the direction of the enemy. And they, and, you know, they they as best they could go take care of the problem. Uh, I really respected the Kurds. That, that's great to hear, and I've only ever heard good things. I'm sure you can't get into details at all. I, I know exactly the engagement you're referring to with the Russians. Uh, you don't have to talk about I won't ask you to talk about it because you mentioned it. Do you ever sit back, and for anyone watching this, you can Google it. You'll find out about it in 10 seconds. Do you ever sit back and think to yourself, I can't believe I was a part of something in so many ways that was historic? Yeah, it it actually happened twice. Uh, I was I was a part of the of of the second uh, skirmish, and what'll hit the news big is is the first one. Gotcha, gotcha, and 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 rightfully so. Um, and so yeah, you, the, the the first one was the 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 big news worth, uh, worthy one. Yeah, just just go Google it. But um, again, uh, it, it's in the news. I'll talk about it a, a, a little bit. But I tell you what's yeah kind of crazy is getting you know being a small team. 
and getting uh, an intel brief about how to uh, about all the different Russian tanks and Syrian tanks that that are in the area. Uh, that was definitely a first. And going, what are we what are we doing? Like this, we're we're, I mean, we're not the team that goes up against uh, tanks. Although ironically enough, we've 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 taken out more than uh, I don't know, maybe more than anyone else. Uh, just just out of the the skirmishes that we've been in and the places we've been. Um, that's not true. Uh, invasion of Iraq, ODAs took out a lot of tanks through javelins, but uh, we've 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 had our fair share with uh, with javelins, and uh, it was definitely a, a, a crazy. Um, a crazy brief and a crazy time. You know, you don't really think that you're going to go, uh, you know, toe to toe with the Russians, you know, so to speak. But in Syria, Syria was a wild time. This is the uh, last question, and then I want to get into you, the the your coffee company that you started. When you look back, you've been out for a couple of few years now. Obviously, you might look back in 20 years. Do you look at this time of your life? that you did in the military and all the crazy shit you did and all the crazy shit you got to see, you got shot, you killed terrorists. Do, do you, does that define you? Or now that you're out, is it more of, yeah, I did that for X amount of years. It was awesome. I, I loved it, but now I'm on to the next thing. It's, it's more of that. And yeah. And I've unfortunately, you know, seen it the other way where guys just have a hard time letting go. And, and I get it, man. It's, I, I assure you, no one knows what it's like at the highest level to, you know, to have the the world's greatest technology step on the world's most powerful, you know, uh, uh, the greatest nation's aircraft uh, alongside. Uh, I try to be humble, but as as a team, we were the best team in the world. No one was as good as us when you get that team together and you you lift off in the middle of the night just knowing you're probably arguably the greatest fighting force this world's ever seen and some poor sap is sleeping right now and has no idea what's coming for him and it's the greatest feeling in the world you know and then to step back on that helicopter with you know the the bravest men you've ever worked with knowing that once again you did your job just like you know good guys won again like they always do not always but unfortunately but basically like we always do and and we did it again um, I definitely wish it, when, when you're in those moments, you never know what mission's going to be your last one. You always assume you got another one coming. So you don't really, you know, take it in the way you should. But, uh, I mean, there's, I, I was glad uh, there was definitely moments as, as I sat there waiting for a helicopter to come back and take me up going, remember this, this, you know, so few people get, you know, this, this is stuff people read about and, and you got to live it. And I just couldn't be any more grateful, you know, that. The, that that I was able to do that on 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 the next step of my life um I I after Syria you know my my third major combat theater and you know deep into the double digits of deployments um I will always miss getting on a helicopter but I I knew that uh you know you can't be on a team forever um I had probably been on a team between ODAs and the unit for for way too long um, you know, my, my, my time was, my time was over and, uh, I didn't want to go do a desk job. Uh, so when, when my team time was done, so was I, so it was a pretty easy decision. I was, I was at ease with my decision. Um, I didn't know what I was going to do next, but I, I knew that that chapter of my life was complete. Well, we kind of know what you're doing now. Cause that's what we're yeah. going to get into next, which is first responders, coffee company, and I, I'll let you take it from here. What what was the purpose of starting the company and kind of what's your long-term goals for where First Responders Coffee Company goes from here? The uh, I, I started training some SWAT teams after I got out. We kind of didn't, didn't mean to. Yeah, I, oddly enough, I just get these calls and say, hey, I need an electric instructor. I'm going here. I'm going there. So I just kind of um, jump onto these training events for SWAT teams. And I didn't expect SWAT teams to be funded like the Delta Force. You know, I'm I'm not naive, but um, you know, but but what I saw, you know, were were really really good guys that their city depended on, just not being funded the way they should. Um, uh, 
I, I me and a SEAL team six guy uh, started a nonprofit uh, for a little bit, which he he continues to do, um, um, and which is Blue Force Strategies, and he raises money and does free training for for law enforcement. Um, unfortunately, uh, I you know, asking for money is is part of a nonprofit. In fact, it's the main part of a nonprofit. Uh, so, um, I, I had this idea that I, I think we could, you know, raise money, um, on our, on our own without, without asking people. And so I kind of landed on first responders coffee company. Um, you know, there's a lot of coffee out there, but not in that space for first responders, for first responder supporters, for first responder, you know, retired first responders. Um, it's a huge market that I thought was untapped. So, uh, we opened that up. And then a couple months ago, we opened up First Responder Cigar Company, and uh, the, the coffee business has been has been good, and we've been able to donate almost twenty thousand dollars back due to coffee, and uh, the cigar business is actually doing better than the coffee business did at the beginning. So, I really think uh, I got high hopes for that, and um, I don't, it's I really feel like as long as we're really to work six and seven days a week like we do will continue to grow as long as, as long as we put in the work. Do you have physical locations or is everything done through your website? Everything's done through the website right now, frccoffee.com, um, frccigars.com. I'll take you to the same website in case if you want to buy cigars, but you don't want to type in coffee, we got you. Um, the, we've had several people reach out to us and want to open up locations, you know, under our, uh, under our brand because they've liked what, you know, so much what we're doing. So we actually have a, uh, a location opening up in, uh, Dublin, Georgia and, um, in January of next year. Um, we're in talks with someone right now about opening up a location here in Orlando. So the, the brick and mortars are coming, but right now, and we have a wholesale side as well. So we're in a bunch of Ace Hardware's, random gun stores. Um, the uh, We're in like 15, 20 cigar shops, you know, so we sell online, but we also have a, a, a wholesale side. So it's, um, it, it's, it's just growing and I love it. And so this is what you do, like this now is your every day, this is the main thing you're doing. This, you're totally... This is it. F uh, F R C C. Every, every day. Um, uh, uh, very few days off. Um, I still haven't made a dollar uh, in this business. Uh, everything's even either been donated or reinvested back into the company. Um, you know, starting your own businesses. I, I knew it was going to be tough. Everyone told me how tough it was going to be. Um, everyone was right. Uh, everything I did was wrong. Like our packaging was wrong from the get go. Our marketing plan was wrong. Um, you know, our logo was wrong. Uh, you know, everything we've done, we've had to relook at and uh, and readdress. So, um, you know, we're we're paying for a lot of those rookie mistakes. But yeah, but luckily we we you know, I have a retirement and we have the revenue to to do that and to give at the same time. So, I don't I don't uh, I don't sit back going man, it's been 10 months and I haven't made a penny yet. Like I, something's got to change. Uh, I still enjoy it. Do you, uh, did you pick, I know you said you picked first responders and first responder supporters because it's a huge market, but it is also kind of adjacent to the military. I mean, it's civilian, but it's people that are working on behalf of the greater good for the people. Is it, does it make you feel kind of connected to the same world you came from? Oh, absolutely. I, uh, we took, um, like 12 firefighters out to the range, uh, you know, completely on us. We took them to the shop, you know, I talked, told them about, um, told them about, I like, let them, let them do their own coffee, uh, taught them about cigars, we got in a van, took them to the range, you know, had guns waiting for them and free ammo and a wound shot with them for, uh, a couple hours. And then we talked about mental health. And, you know, I have a very different take on mental health uh, than than most people. You know, we, we have, we live in a weird world where everyone tells these first responders, hey, you're going to see horrible things. You're not going to be able to deal with it and it's going to crush you and you're going to have to, you know, go out and seek help and you'll be a broken man the rest of your life. And that's just not true. But if you keep telling people that, 
it, it, it'll be true. And I'm not saying that, you know, they'll, that, that, you know, don't go seek help, you know, and I'm not saying that, you know, seeing the worst thing in the world won't break you, but you know, we, we have to have a realistic look at, at, uh, at mental health and not, and I just, and not the current one we have. I, I agree with you hundred percent. I'm actually really glad you mentioned that, uh, another former guy from the same unit you came from, although I think uh, a decent amount before your time, he made a comment and I'm paraphrasing that, you know, if we lose some guys, you don't tell everyone, okay, now you go home, you feel sad, you drink yourself to death. You know, you just feel terrible. It's like, no, you tell them, yeah, today was a bad day and tomorrow we're going to kick the shit out of them. And that's the attitude. If you tell them that they're going to be eager to get back out there in the streets. If you tell them, oh, this is awful and it's only going to get worse. We, what do you think they're going to do? We have what's probably what I believe to be the, the worst, um, the worst approach uh, to it, which is then we give guys time off for them to deal with it. That's the, that's the worst thing you can do. Go back to work, keep your mind busy, keep working. If you go home and don't do anything for a week, you will lament and think about it and think about it and think about it. And, it, and it's a hard rut to get out of. You have to go back to work. You know, you, you want to honor that guy's memory, go on target again. Exactly. And the, and the sooner you do it, the better. That that's exactly almost word for word what this other guy said. Did you personally ever have any stuff where it took you, you know, you kind of had to punch through and just get through it or mentally were you pretty much, you were good to go with hiccups along the way, but mostly fine. I was, uh, I, I mean, I'm, I'm human like anyone else. Uh, I mean, most of the tears that, uh, that you cry are really for the family. You know, you feel, you know, they always seem to have kids, you know, they always, have young kids or, or just, you know, a, an amazing wife, you know, and you're, you just feel horrible for them. Um, but, uh, you know, you, you, you deal with it, you internalize it and you just go back to work. I love it's it. that simple. Here's, here's the thing just to you know, talk. I have a hard time with, you know, with some of the, you know, psychologists because they have book knowledge on this and I don't think there's any other profession where they have no real world experience in a subject that they that they profess to be subject matter experts on. They don't know what it's like to lose a loved one. You know, they don't know what it's like to carry a dead teammate, but they're gonna tell you how to deal with it. And I just I I have a problem with that. You know, you know who the people we should be listening to? The people who have done that and then, you know, have come out on top. Let's so I don't have a college degree on it, but I, I have better than that. I have real world experience. I love it. I love it. this. Is my last question for you, Brent. And, and this is, this has exceeded all expectations. When you look back in 20, 30, 40 years, 50 years, if you, if you're blessed with to live that long of a life, do you have one memory from your time in service that you look back and say, that's the one thing I'm so proud that, that you can talk about, obviously you just say, I'm so proud of that one thing? Uh, there's, there's two, but they're the same. Um, when I got, when I got selected to be a green beret, I called my dad <laughs> and I said, Hey, your son's gonna be a green beret. And, uh, and it was the coolest phone call I got to make. My dad's not a very emotional guy. Uh, and my dad, you know, and I knew my dad was proud of me that day. And I gave him the same phone call in West Virginia at Delta force selection. when I called my dad and said, Hey, your son's going to the Delta Force, and uh, just that that quiet response of "proud of your son" was oh, you know, so the, it's the simple yet coolest time of my life. 